speak this morning is found on him on page 236, What Child Is This? Hymn number 236, What Child Is This?
you for that. Behold the babe of Bethlehem, by angel host adored. This babe whom mortals shall condemn is heaven's wealth outpoured. Sing Alleluia, sing Alleluia. Behold, the babe of Bethlehem is Jesus Christ, the Lord. Now, whether you believe that or not makes all the difference in the world. Maybe it even makes some difference in this world, but it makes even more difference in the world to come. By way of introduction this morning, I'm going to take us first of all to the book of Luke. As we anticipate the Christmas season, we're beginning with Luke chapter 1. Last week we read about the birth of John the Baptist through Zechariah and Elizabeth. This week we're going to back up to the preceding verses before that. In Luke chapter 1, we're going to look at um, the uh, Dr. Luke's record of what he is recording for all the world to know and understand. So let's stand together as we read this text. I will read it from Luke chapter 1, verses 1 through 4, and you can follow along. For as much as many have taken in hand to set forth in order a declaration of those things which are most surely believed among us, even as they delivered them unto us, which from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word, it seemed good to me also, having had perfect understanding of all things from the very first, to write unto thee in order, most excellent Theophilus, that thou mightest know the certainty of those things wherein thou hast been instructed. Let us pray. Our God in heaven, we ask that you will open our hearts to this text this morning and that we would be thoroughly convinced and know our, uh, the basis of our faith and that which has been passed down to us not just as something that has been given to us and that we've been told what to believe, but in having given us the truth and having given us the opportunity to observe these things as they have been recorded and to understand the firsthand knowledge of them, we pray that you will help us to acknowledge those things and that you would preserve us as we have placed our faith and trust in those things which we have learned from your word, in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. By way of introduction, you, if you may have heard it said, or if you haven't, you may sooner than later hear it said that the consideration of judgment and condemnation are illusions. Have you ever heard that described in some form or another? Well, I have been preparing a, a conversation about a particular series of books that I'm not going to announce right now, except to suggest coming soon to a Sunday school class near you, we're going to start talking about one of these uh, books and authors, but essentially the subject matter of what I'm referring to this morning serves by way of introduction to what Luke has recorded in his first chapter. These conversations that I'm talking about are telling us that there are illusions, that we have found ourselves in a world of illusions, such as the illusion that failure exists, the illusion that judgment and condemnation exists. There are such things stated that I wanted to pick out a few more to suggest what we are coming up against. Ultimate reality, you've heard of that. 
ultimate reality we are told will differ a great deal from what many people in your world are now agreeing is real. That's an interesting statement. What is real is now dependent on what we as a people agree together is real. That's interesting. That's a self-affirming reality. You might as well have one of those goggles on your face and, and you just you know plug in a program and this is now real. If everybody in the world had those goggles on, was running the same program, everybody would agree this is now real. And you can understand the fallacy of that. It's obviously an artificial reality. Other comments that have been made. We are being told to put aside what we have been taught is right and then learn it for ourselves. Well, doesn't the Bible say that there is, that there is no private interpretation to the prophecies of Scripture? We are also told that the point is that God is everyone's God, and everyone of all faiths and traditions are supposed to be able to read this and feel included. Well, that sounds like pantheism at its best, and God has in the Old Testament addressed the concepts of pantheism and, and have condemned it. In fact, when we were visiting Israel, there were some some shrines that were shown to us where they were even a, a, in a pantheistic shrine where they had any of the, the gods that they might want to worship are there. They can we just look in a different nook in the cliffs of the rocks and find a different deity to worship. He says, I disavowed myself from the Bible years ago because the judgment, the idea of sin, the materialism and greed in my Christian church and the fear masked in the language of love no longer served my personal growth. You know, there's some sense of truth to this in that in some of these cases you will find that their Christian church has obviously fallen down on declaring the truths of God's Word. Yes, they say many of the rules created by the church are dismissed as no longer serving where we want to go. Well, who's in charge of what message the church is supposed to be declaring? Well, I think that's enough of that introduction. Let's get to the message and see what God's Word has to say. In Luke chapter 1, this starts out with a declaration. As the doctor Luke has described here, he is giving a declaration of those things which are most surely believed among us. Let's talk about faith for just a minute. In John 20, verse 31, these many other things are not written in this book that Jesus did in all of his uh, miracles. Many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples that are not written in this book. But these are written that ye may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. John 20, verse 31. This concept of believing, is this just a matter of what the... A young child is told on our Christmas movies that if you just believe, and if everybody believes, then Christmas will turn out all right. Is it simply a matter of just believing? Obviously not. Believing is a matter of being persuaded. Believing is a matter of trusting in something. And we have learned through the scriptures to trust in Jesus Christ. And Paul uh, and Luke is in the process of setting that out as this declaration of things which are most surely believed among us. The concept of believing is 
the concept of being persuaded in one way or another. I remember hearing a radio program. It was a, it was a Santa Claus hotline where kids could, of course, with the permission of their parents, call in to this radio personality and talk to them as if they were Santa. And one child was recorded as having declared this, I can't believe I'm talking to the real Santa. Can you imagine when you call in on the telephone and you hear this, ho, 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 how are you, my little Christie? I don't know how Santa got her name, but obviously Mom told him when they made the phone connection, but whatever, this poor child was actually able to make, <laughs> make that statement as if she honestly believed that she was talking to the real Santa Claus. Well, obviously we're not talking about simple belief of that nature. As Luke put it, he used the word surely believed. The word surely believed has the concept of being persuaded by a reasonable consideration. It has the, do, has the concept of firmly believing. And even to the point where sometimes... I get the impression that we firmly believe something and it comes across as I've made up my mind and don't confuse me with the facts. We can firmly believe even that which is not entirely true. And just to take it one step further, Dr. Luke puts it with another adjective in front of it, most surely believe. I guess that's an adverb, not an adjective, isn't it? We're talking about the verb of believing, and we are most surely believing. And this, and we look at the Greek construction that puts this together, and it gives us something that in English would sound like pragmatics shown to the full. Evaluated by different individuals, reasoned together based on facts and many counselors, and like a jury being able to come to a conclusion. Uh, seeing also Romans 4, Romans 4 verses 19 through 21, it says, Be not weak in faith. Referring to Abraham, who was not weak in faith. He considered not his own body now dead when he was about a hundred years old, neither yet he yet the deadness of Sarah's womb. He staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God, and being fully persuaded that what he had promised, he was able also to perform. We also have 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 5 that talks about, Watch thou in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, Make full proof of thy ministry. And down in verse 17, the thought continues, Notwithstanding, the Lord stood with me and strengthened me, that by me the preaching might be fully known, and that all the Gentiles might hear. And I was delivered out of the mouth of the lion. I have that verse posted in my office, and I like to reflect on that many times. But God... The Lord, he says, the Lord stood with me, strengthened me, that by me the preaching might be fully known, not just hinted at, but by scripture text and identifying what God has told us in his word. This is what God has told us. This is what we believe because God has proven it to us. This is what we believe, but why do we believe this? And we need to put some meat to the basis as to why we believe this. And so Dr. Luke carries on in verses 2 through 4. He tells us that the source of what we believe is coming from they that they that delivered these things unto us, which from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word. They from the beginning. We, all, we have the record of Mark. In the beginning of the book of Mark, he records the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. 
as it is written in the prophets. John gave us in John 15 and verse 27, Ye also shall bear witness, because ye have been with me from the beginning. And now we come back to Acts chapter 1 and verses 21 and 22. Wherefore of these men which have companied with us all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John unto that same day that he was taken up from us, must one be ordained to be a witness with us of his resurrection. This, of course, is talking about the selection of Matthias to replace that of Judas in the ministry that the disciples were being called to accomplish. Eyewitnesses of Jesus, ministers of the Word, the Word referring to the Logos of John chapter 1, ministers referring to assistance, that is, assistance of Jesus, being Peter and John and the rest of the disciples. They were his servants. The word under rower has been used. Jesus was the focus point, but his disciples were the eyewitnesses of Jesus, and they are the ones who have declared what they have seen and heard, and they have passed it down to us. You know, the first time I heard someone describe the northern lights and the beauty of color that comes, away, comes from them, because they had seen it themselves, I said, wow, that must have been beautiful. I had no reason to doubt except that I hadn't seen it myself. And you know, I still have not seen the northern lights in their colorful displays. But I have no trouble believing it because it comes from eyewitness accounts whom I trust and know that they would not lie if they had seen it. I don't have any problem believing it. They are a credible source of witness. And that's what Luke is talking about here as as he is recording what the eyewitnesses have given to him. They which from the beginning were eyewitnesses. And then, uh, down in verse 3. I lost my place in Luke chapter 1. Luke chapter 1 and in verse 3, he adds another level of eyewitness account. It says, it seemed good to me also. Luke also adding his own, subsequent to the eyewitnesses that he's reported, he's adding his own witness, having had perfect understanding of all things from the very first to write unto the in order. In other words, Dr. Luke is saying, I was there. I have no problem thinking that Dr. Luke may have been Mary's family doctor, who in his own right would have been very much surprised to find Mary with, ba with a baby, being able to acknowledge and accommodate the understanding that she was yet a virgin. I have no problem understanding that. If that were the case, the Bible doesn't specifically state that in as many words but it does give us that this is Luke's understanding from the beginning, from the beginning of time, from the beginning of the time of these events. He's saying, this is my belief. It falls right in line with what they have told us already. A perfect understanding is an examination thoroughly investigating and following up and, and tracing a matter's course. If you think there is the slightest hint that there was an issue with Mary being a virgin, do you think that Luke would have just dismissed it or bypassed it? I believe that would have been the talk of the town. Luke, having put his own medical practice on the line for defending such a thing. But this was Luke's testimony as well. Having examined thoroughly investigated, and even from the very beginning, even going back to Zechariah and Elizabeth. Possibly from the very first, referring to being 
that which is from above, or referencing the, the Holy Spirit and the concept of being born again. Luke is adding his identification of credibility to his witnesses. We are to know the certainty of what we believe. One of the lines that was that was recorded, or one of the lines that I copied out off of this source that I started out with in my message this morning, he makes a concluding statement that says, therefore we cannot know the truth that we are required to know in order to meet the conditions that we are required to meet in order to receive the love that we are required to receive in order to avoid the condemnation that we are seeking to avoid in order to have the everlasting life that we had before any of this started. Can you see his cyclical reasoning coming from the Garden of Eden, coming down through a, a judgment for sin, but in all of what he is saying, he completely bypasses the mercy and the grace of God that's available. We are not simply left to play the game and hope we get it right. We have been given from the scriptures that tell us that yes, God is going to judge sin. We are also given from those same scriptures that God is not willing that any should perish, that is being judged in hell but that all should come to repentance. But therein lies the biggest problem. Mankind does not want to repent because mankind does not want to think that there is any concept of guilt or that I should feel guilty. That doesn't change God's word. Nor does it diminish God's grace and mercy which is still available to all who would believe what God's word says, not what the societal norm or the majority of our friends believe. We know whom we have believed. We know the certainty of our faith. We need to own our own faith and we need to be able to defend our own faith so, so that whosoever believeth in him, Jesus Christ, and his death on the cross to pay that penalty so that we don't have to, might not perish, but have everlasting life. Let us pray. Our God in heaven, we thank you for reminding us once again of the eyewitness accounts that defend the story of the gospel of Jesus Christ. The very credible witnesses of those who had seen, as well as the very highly professional medical staff that was there and adding his own witness and testimony. Lord, we recognize that there is a truth that cannot be denied, but we also recognize that the world is setting, up, setting aside that which is true and setting up a, a false reality to become our new ultimate reality. I pray, God, that your Holy Spirit would strike through the way only you can to open our eyes to your truth. And may your name be glorified. In Jesus' name, amen. We have one closing hymn, number 388. Number 388, I know whom I have believed. May this be the, the testimony of each one of us who have trusted in Jesus Christ as our Savior. If there is any question or comment, you're probably getting this by the YouTube channel. Go ahead and reply to our YouTube channel. You can find my email address there on our, our website. If, you, if you've already gotten to the YouTube channel, then our website is linked to that, augustabaptist.org. Be happy to hear from whoever wants to add comment to this message. All right, number 388, I know whom I have believed. We'll stand together and we'll, we'll sing all four verses of this hymn.
Yeah.